right, well, for more on this breaking news from City and Bank of America and the additional $20 billion coming out of the government, including the backstop of all of those toxic assets, it's kind of shocking. I'm joined by Jim Moorhead. He's a partner at the law firm Steptoe and Johnson and a former investment banker at Goldman Sachs. And Ramesh Menon is the founder and president of Structured Investment Management and the former managing director of Structured Products at Citigroup. Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Um, I'm going to start with Ramesh. Uh, let's first focus on Citigroup, if we can do that initially here. The big story coming out this morning is they have decided to separate the banks, the bank into two completely separate entity, entities under the same bank holding company. One is going to be the global consumer bank, Citicorp. The other one's the city holdings with the asset management business, city financial, uh, the toxic assets, which are backstopped by the government. What does that suggest to you about their plan to fix the issue? Well, Alexis, obviously they're in uh, a mode of controlled unwind. Mm -hmm. This is pretty much the end of Citigroup as we know it. Unfortunately, though, management seems to be operating at the behest of the government and acting in the government's best interest instead of looking out for shareholders. What the company ought to be doing at this point in time, knowing that the government has stepped up and taken ownership of the legacy problems, is to be building for the future. They know they have the government behind them. They know they have as much capital as they could possibly want. They should be going out and trying to reconstitute the company in order that it might survive and prosper in better times now that they have a backstop. So Jim, would you agree about that? Because there are some who have suggested that the model that Sandy Weil created many years ago, which frankly had nothing to do with the repeal of Glass-Steagall, was a model that just never had success. If you look at the long-term returns, it never proved profitable. So does this give them a chance to perhaps turn things around? Yeah, I think it does because I think that one of the problems for city has always been it's been so sprawling the superstore uh, concept hasn't worked and investors can't get a handle on what's really behind the city group black box so i think this is an effort to say okay we are going to focus going forward on retail and commercial banking with some investment banking thrown in and we are putting to the side those troubled businesses that haven't done well so I think that does make it easier for investors going forward to understand Citi and to make a judgment about it as an investment. Yeah, I would imagine, uh, Ramesh, here that what would happen is the, the Citi Corp, the global consumer banking, which has been doing much better than some of the brokerage parts of it because of the structured groups that you very well know um, uh, from the CDOs, the CIVs, et cetera. But th there's two points I want to make. One is that the city holdings portion still has the brokerage and asset management, which many people consider is the crown jewel. Um, they still have their local consumer finance. Now, they do have the toxic assets, but it probably would be wrong to characterize this as a good bank, bad bank scenario because they're putting a lot of good into city holdings. I would agree with you, Alexis. Essentially what's going on is that the company is being downsized to match the capabilities of management, which is exactly the opposite of what should be happening. What we need is a management team that can actually manage the company. There's no question that Sandy had a terrific vision, but the execution was awful. Uh, the model has worked in certain instances, as in the case of J.P. Morgan. Uh, if management was truly capable and was acting in the interest of shareholders, uh, they might approach this differently. Interesting, because Dick Parsons made it very clear uh, in a quote in a release here. He said the Citigroup Board of Directors is committed to strong, independent corporate governance at all times, but especially in challenging conditions. There has been one announced departure from the board together with other anticipated departures. This gives us the opportunity to reconstitute the board, and we will do so as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, Jim, we're looking right now at what has happened to the stock performance here. We're going to bring up also a full screen here of some of the board members. Uh, I imagine they've got to make some serious changes at the board level when you consider the fact that accountability is called into question. We already know that Robert Rubin, one of the top, he, obviously the chairman of the board, has stepped down. Many anticipate that Dick Parsons will be the chairman of the board. What do you think? Well, I think City has to make those kind of moves. Um, the federal government is the first and only responder here. There isn't anyone else who's going to be stepping up to lend money to city. So the federal government is sending the word, we're in charge here, we want to see a new board, and we want to see a new strategy. I don't think that city could stand pat. So it has to start slimming down the bank. It has to try and fetch some money for some assets. And I think it has to send the message that 
we're going to be a more conservative bank going forward, and that's what the federal government wants. No more risky trading strategies. Okay, let's switch gears because the other huge story of the morning is what is going on with Bank of America. Ken Lewis went into what many people perceived as a dangerous transaction on the weekend that Lehman Brothers failed by going in there, buying Merrill Lynch, a property he was interested in for years. Many suggested at the time he overpaid. Many people thought he overpaid for countrywide credit. Now, the chicken is coming home to roost here. Shareholders are furious they agreed on the deal on December 5th. What happened between December 5th and these meetings that ensued between Ken Lewis and the government as it regards to this Merrill Lynch transaction, Ramesh? Uh, I would suggest that the problem was that Ken Lewis got sold a bill of goods by John Thane over the weekend. Uh, his hubris and his ego probably dominated the proceedings. This is a company that he's wanted for some time, didn't work through the numbers, got sold on it, and now, you know, looking at the, looking at the numbers, looking at what has happened to Merrill's asset portfolio in the interim, it's obviously a disaster. So he goes back to the government and says, look, we might not have been able to close this, can you help? And the government, perhaps instead of letting some institutions Phil have said we've got to do whatever we can to solve this. Yeah, I mean, as we understand it, Jim, it, it sounds like the Fed chair and the standing Treasury Secretary Paulson said you will destabilize the capital markets if you back away from the deal. It sounded like Ken Lewis wanted to back away from the deal, but here it was. Everybody speculated John Thane was going to be the heir apparent to Ken Lewis. I couldn't imagine now the two of them sitting in a room together. No, I think that marriage is uh, on the rocks. Uh, I think that the threat from Ken Lewis was to undo the deal, I don't think was what he really wanted. I think he wanted what he's getting, which is the federal government yes. stepping in mm -hmm. to inject more money, to backstop uh, some of the toxic assets. I think, though, going forward, uh, we can expect litigation coming out of this situation because shareholders are saying to themselves, why didn't we hear about this before the December 5th Outrageous. shareholder vote? Absolutely outrageous. And, and, and Ramesh, I mean, look, they're cutting their quarterly different down, dividend down to a penny. As I understood it, I know a lot of people within there, the marriage of the Merrill Lynch people walking in there to Bank of America was horrific at the start. The level of anger and frustration from the very beginning. And now that the Bank of America employees are aware of this Merrill Lynch situation. I imagine the, the culture clash here is going to be a disaster. How does, how does Ken Lewis turn this thing around? Uh, it's going to be really hard. Uh, what I think some serious uh, decisions need to be made about management. One single person is going to have to be in charge. We saw with Sandy Weil and John Reed 10 years ago, sharing doesn't work. Uh, there's going to have to be strong management. There's going to have to be a culture forced down upon the organization. People are going to have to get in line or leave. But it is going to be a really hard thing. Thing. There is a divergence of interest once again between shareholders who obviously care about the stock price and the government and the FDIC that cares about the integrity of the bank. Don't forget the directors and officers are at risk for enforcement action by the FDIC if they do anything to weaken the bank, whereas obviously the board is at risk if they don't look out for shareholders' interests. So I think this is the beginning of an iceberg in that sense. Yeah, and, 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 and when you think about this, Jim, I mean, when you look back, when was the conversation? We were having this conversation about two, three weeks ago when John Thane wanted $10 million for the bonus and the board said no. I mean, it, it, the, the story, I, the, the, the hair associated with this I, is unimaginable. L let's not address the hair for a moment. Let's address, Jim, the bigger issue, which is we, the taxpayer, have now backstopped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of assets. Are these capital injections and the backstop of these assets enough, or does the government either need to buy all troubled assets or insure all toxic assets across the bank universe? Well, if you think back to two months ago, this was exactly the question we asked about Citigroup when the government stepped in and injected an additional $20 billion and then also backstopped up to $300 billion of toxic assets. Was it enough? And we know the answer now is no. And I think we unfortunately know the answer going forward, which is it's not enough. The government will get called on to do more. And I think that you're right that the better way for it to go is to guarantee the toxic assets. Otherwise, they're in a situation where they're continuing to inject capital in and probably becoming majority owner and nationalizing the banks.
It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, Jim, as always, a great pleasure seeing you and Ramesh, wonderful having you as well. We're, of course, going to continue to cover this story. But there's, other, there's another huge story of the morning. Take a look. All right, Liz. Thank you.